Welcome into Rounding the Bases, the podcast about culture and leadership with a baseball twist presented by Enterprise Bank and Trust, hashtag no stopping you. Enterprise Bank and Trust was founded by entrepreneurs with the core focus of serving privately owned small and medium-sized businesses who have a story to tell, which I do. Enterprise Bank's commitment is to listen, learn, and guide clients to a lifetime of financial success. Enterprise Bank together, there's no stopping you. My name is Joel Goldberg. Welcome into the show. Coming to you from the Kansas City Audiovisual Studios. They create engaging spaces. Check them out at kcav.com. Really awesome guest today with so many interesting stories to tell. Jeff Eckert is the proverbial jack of all trades. My kind of guy, someone that is in the middle of all types of different things. Uh, from being a trade school graduate to getting an MBA at the oldest university in America. Does anybody know what that is? It's the College of William and Mary. To obtaining multiple certifications in finance, accounting, and human resources. I can't do all that stuff. Uh, exploring new horizons and challenges, horizons and challenges that seem to drive him onward. It, it's really a wide range of a resume here, which includes rising up through the ranks in Fortune 500, the nonprofit environment, multiple industries, to the level of CFO, where he is right now. Uh, Jeff is also run a consulting company. He's helped over 125 companies start up, improve, and grow. He's a mentor at heart, whether teaching at the college level for 20 or more years, coaching, officiating sports. We've got a lot to talk about regarding that, training new officials, or writing a book to help others. Jeff has done it all. He is the CFO at Catholic Charities of Kansas City St. Joseph, not to mention an author and a referee. And I'm excited right now to bring in to the program, Jeff Eckert, who is wearing, uh, for those that'll be watching, his Chiefs gear, not the stripes of the zebra, which he'll do on certain nights of the week. Jeff, how are you? Doing well, Joel. Thanks for having me. Well, it's good to visit with you, and I want to talk about your book. I want to talk about Catholic Charities. I want to talk about the times that we're in right now, which very much relate to refing and sportsmanship and trying to get along a little bit better. But before I do that, I mean, that was a long resume. And a lot of people that have been at it, like me and you and so many others, have long resumes. But typically, they don't involve so many different endeavors. Just tell me overall about the journey, one that started, you mentioned, with trade schools and now has you at a very high-level position of a, a very big organization. You know, I think, Joel, it's really, in my case, you know, there are some people that I graduated with in high school that knew what they wanted to be from day one. They wanted to be a doctor, lawyer, whatever the case may be. Um, that wasn't the case with me. It was it was about exploration and it was about looking at different, uh, different opportunities. And it was sort of funny because my dad had told me when I graduated high school, I did a little bit of junior college and didn't like it. And he said, well, you're not going to sit here your whole life. You're either going to join the military or go to a trade school. And so that that started the journey, right? Get a little push there. But then what happens is you you, you go from there and you see, um, you start working for a big company like Emerson Electric, which I work for, and you find out that they're going to pay for 75% of my college if I go at night. So you take advantage of that opportunity. It's, it's sort of one step after another and seeing an opportunity and and not letting it go to waste really is what it is. <clears throat> and it's led me to, to different things. And sometimes disappointments, you know, motivate you as well, where maybe you don't get a job because you don't have a certain certification. And so you say, I'm not going to let that happen again. I'm going to go get another certification and, and you move down the road. But it's, for me, it's been really just seizing some small opportunities after small opportunities and uh, with a, with a mentorship heart as well. Well, I think first and foremost, when you're involved in so many different endeavors or so many different fields, what you do is you collect knowledge over the years and you collect relationships and people and, and a network, and then you share what you've learned. If, if you are a mentor at heart, hopefully all of us are to some extent and some more than others, but we can describe your career as treasury, healthcare, pediatrics, nonprofit. I know that you didn't expect that journey when it started. None of us know exactly what the journey is going to look like, but certainly you didn't expect this as you were going to trade school. But how much has that shaped you being involved in so many different things? Well, it really does um, expand your horizons, right? You, you know, a lot of people like to, you know, come to work. For example, when I was in uh, 
treasury management, we came in every day and we called the banks for two hours and we did this for another hour. And it was very, very structured. Right. And that one of the things that drove me was that that absolute structure was something that that just didn't appeal to me. And so anytime there were these opportunities that um, allowed me to broaden my horizons and, and take on a new task or a new role, I usually took those. And, you know, it even goes back to officiating. And I started officiating when I was 45 years old. And so it's it's hard to be a student when you're 45 years old, but at the same time, you're, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to expand, certainly to give back as well, but uh, expand your horizons. And that's really what it's taught me is to keep, keep looking for those ways to, to gain knowledge. And, and by gaining that knowledge, you also gain new relationships and new friends and, and things of that nature. And that's, that's sort of what's been driving me the whole, the whole time. I think there's an interesting balance there too. And I know everybody says it, hopefully they mean it, but we should never stop learning even as we get older and guys like you guys, like me, we've been at it a really long time, but there's not a day that goes by where I'm not learning something that's healthy. But then the flip side of that is there's not a day going by where I don't try to pass something on and help mentor in some form or another or share what I've learned. I think that's what makes the world go round. But there's also an element, and I know that you and I have talked about this before, of humility. Because when you get older, and I'll just call older meaning guys our age and, and above, it, it's easier sometimes, I think, just to say, well, maybe not that we have it all figured out, but I'm not going to ask for help. It's I, I don't want to look like, like I'm vulnerable if I've been around the block for so long. But with the amount of career changes and career paths that, that you've taken, not to mention we'll get into the officiating in a bit, there had to be a, a level of humility and vulnerability, didn't there? Absolutely. You, know, you, you walk into you know, a, a large medical clinic and it, you know, it has 30 different subspecialties and it has a variety of different types of patients that you're seeing. And that's where I spent most of my career was in healthcare. You, you know, you are learning every single day. You know, when when the doctor takes you into the operating room and you can see procedures being done, uh, it's it's eye opening on how much you don't know. And I think that that grounds you as well. And and even I know we're going to talk about the book, but even in the book, I, there's a chapter on humility as the cornerstone of of uh, raising athletes right. And and I think you're right. I mean, it's a case of um, when when you start something new. Uh, there's an old saying that you have to be at it for 10,000 hours before you become an expert, right? Uh, and if you, if you go into it with that mindset, then the other thing that happens is people open up to you and they're, they're willing to help you. And they're willing to say, hey, you know, this is a good guy or a, a good lady and, and I'm willing to, to mentor her or him and bring, bring them along. You know, if, you, if you've got a closed mind mentality, that's never going to happen. And so... The, Variety, you're right. It does force you to be a little bit on the on the humble side, and and uh, you know, and and that helps you in turn learn and grow. Well, I wanted to ask you about that, and we'll go we'll go officiating second. Catholic Charities first. This is a, a major organization, and there's a bunch that I want to ask you about this, which I think would be interesting in any times, but certainly during a pandemic, because I know that you guys have one been able to figure it out been able to figure out as, as well as possible during these times, but, but to, you kind of had to, cause there's so many people relying on you. So tell me about your role at Catholic charities and then sort of how you, as an organization, how you've been able to navigate this year. Sure. Well, as chief financial officer, I'm responsible for everything that is in that realm uh, and also assist in the HR uh, arena as well with them. Um, you know, I, I got that job just as part of a journey uh, and meeting the, the that was there. Uh, and we had some nice conversations um, and one thing led to another. And, and he said, you, you're the type of guy with a broad background that I want to have. The organization itself is tremendous. I mean, it's been around for 142 years now. Uh, they started off as an orphanage and we still have adoptions as one of our uh, four pillars that we that we uh, that we provide uh, to families, but we've got uh, employment services. Uh, we have a welcome center for emergency assistance. We have housing development and housing services that we provide. 
through a housing first model, which basically says you take people and you get them stable in, in homes. And then from there, you can uh, you can address the addictions and you can address the, the job issues and things of that nature. And so we we basically have that model, but we are a, what I call a multi-service organization. You know, there are, there are great nonprofits out there that just do one thing and they do it well. Uh, we have our hands sort of like my career in a lot of different pies. Uh, and we, you know, that, that presents a lot of different challenges uh, as well. But we have over uh, 50 different funding sources and 25 different grants that we have, federal, state, local, as well as the donations. We have a big gala uh, and, and other special events that we put on every year. Uh, so it is quite, for, for a, you know, it is not a $200 million dollar organization. It's about a seven to eight million dollar organization, but it is extremely complex. And we serve over 10,000 clients uh, a year uh, in a variety of ways. So it's, uh, it's just uh, doing really good work for a lot of people. And at this time, as much as I would imagine almost any ever, more of a need because more people are struggling for all the reasons that we know during this pandemic. So What's the mindset been over there? Because, you know, first and foremost, you do have to be able to take care of your own people as well if, if they're going to function. And I know that's been really important. If you can't take care of your own people, you can't take care of the community, which is very wide ranging here in Kansas City, St. Joe and this whole area. So how have you been able to do that so that you can, in essence, be there when you've been needed the most? Sure. We, you know, a lot of our staff are social workers and and have that that background that mindset and so we i think we have a leg up on a lot of different companies because they have a service mentality right from the get-go so when things get bad that's when they rise to the forefront and that's when they step up their game because that's you know that's what it's all about for them and so a lot of companies when it gets when it gets busy you see people grumbling and and uh, you know, talking about how bad it is, we're, we're in the solution business, right? So we have people that are potentially being evicted from homes that we're trying to to serve, and you know, and other uh, other food uh, insecurity uh, issues that are out there. And and with the pandemic, uh, that's exacerbated everything. And the staff that we have have stepped up tremendously to to serve them. And so it's, I guess we're lucky is what I'm saying, because we, we have that sort of built in their, their DNA. The, the rough, they really, uh, they step up to the plate. And we have seen that and we've been blessed as well because governments recognize the good work that we do. And they have actually given us in many cases, more funds to take care of those people. Uh, so we have seen for our veteran services, for example, and we've seen in our welcome center that we've actually gotten more funding to uh, to assist with utilities and housing and and uh, all the other services that they need. It's a lot, I know, and and again, so important. I, you know, it's also it's just such a unique time, Jeff. In terms of, we all need more more good in this world. There's just between the pandemic, between racial injustice between everybody being, uh, not everybody, but often locked up in their homes and going stir crazy, not to mention the politics and the division. And so it has to be, I, I would imagine, very rewarding to, to be able to help so many people out, to be involved in an organization that has the, uh, that ability to affect and change lives. As a guy that, that has, has searched for purpose and your why throughout your career, and I think as a guy that is has always been aware of that. And I think you can correct me if I'm wrong, as we get older, we really start to under, understand that a little bit better. How much has that helped you with your purpose and your why right now? I mean, it, it, it's been a, a search my entire career as to, you know, what mission fits with what I want to do with my life in a professional manner. Um, you know, every, every company has a mission, but to find a mission driven company such as Catholic charities is, um, is a gold mine because you have, again, you have, um, the actual things that you're doing on a daily basis to help individuals when they come in, you're face to face with the people that you're helping. You're not just selling widgets over in, in, um, 
you know, uh, Canada, uh, if you will, uh, you're actually putting hands on. And, and I started my healthcare career in mental health uh, with the Missouri Institute of Mental Health over 30 years ago. And, and that was the first uh, instance going from corporate to, to healthcare that I saw the mission and I saw the ability to really, um, to really help others. And so it's, uh, Catholic Charities has just been um, wonderful in that regard. They, um, you know, they are frontline. They are essential, and they uh, they are the ones that uh, are not only helping, but they're praying with with our clients. You know, they're helping them emotionally and spiritually as well as financially, uh, and that's that's a rare combination with a business. So, on top of all of that, your role as a CFO, you so CFO by day referee by night, at least some nights. And you mentioned and you referenced, and then I want to talk about your book, Sportsmanship Go Viral with it. I want to talk about, first and foremost, what motivated you to go into a career of officiating. There's not a whole lot of love in that. There's not a whole lot of money in that, I don't think. But Mm -hmm. I, I know that almost anyone that's doing it has a love and a passion for it. You certainly have to take some abuse and all of that type of thing. So what at 45 years old made you say, you know what? I think I want to try this. Right. Well, you know what they say, those who can't do teach, right? <laughs> those who, can't do, who can't play officiate. Well, it, I think it really goes back to this men, mentorship mentality that you know, I didn't have a mentor growing up other than my father, you know, so what I want to do is I want to give back and, I coached my kids and I, and other kids for, you know, until they got into high school, you know, you know, played, played in high school, then coached. And then when that ran its course, you say, what's next? How do I stay engaged with the sport? How do I, you know, I have a love for the game. What do I do? And officiating was the next logical choice. And, and yeah, at 45, I said, um, you know, there are a couple of, I was watching my daughter's game and a couple of the officials were from the old guard. Um, and, uh, I talked to him at halftime and said, you know, you need an old guy like me. And they were like, heck yes, get out here. We'll, we'll train you. And <clears throat> one thing led to another. And I recall the first time stepping on the court, it was like, oh my God, what did I get myself into? You know, there's a, there's a lot more to this than, uh, than just yelling at people from the stands. Right. And then, like you said, you, you, you humble yourself and you, you take teaching from, you know, expert officials that are 20 years younger than you uh, and that are going on to the NBA and, and you, you know, put one foot in front of the other and learn. So it it was really just the natural step to go do that. And and by God's grace, I'm able to help others, whether it's at Blue Valley Recreation Complex or, you know, it was at CYO for a while, training new officials. Um, you know, it, it, it's all a big circle, right? And so I'm glad to stay. So, I, you know, I, I think it's interesting too because – you had to climb your way up, you know, just because you were maybe 20 years old or 15 years older than the other guys. What was that like to be doing what freshman high school basketball games and, and watching these young guys doing varsity games. And, and, you know, as well as I do that, that the level of play for the freshman isn't going to touch the level of varsity. There's a reason why they're not on varsity yet. And so those games could be a little bit more sloppy, probably a lot more teaching involved with those young kids, but how did that go for you? Well, it, you know, I, part of the other reason I got in there was because I had seen some officials that weren't um, that weren't as professional as they could be in terms of effort and and whatnot. And the one thing I said is, I, this is out of my hands, right? I want to do this because I want to stay engaged, and so I'm going to present the best me that I can. I'm going to hustle every play. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be dressed well. I'm going to learn the rules and that I've come to be known as sort of the rules geek when I'm, when I'm on a crew, you know, you got a guy who manages the game really well and you got, you know, you got a rules geek out there and that that's sort of me. So you need one of each on, on every crew, but, but, you know, doing that and, and just saying I can control what I can control. And if somebody sees something in me that they want to promote me from girls, freshman bead up to sophomore to, to JV, um, then so be it. And, and so I've, I took that approach you know, starting out. And maybe if I was 20, I wouldn't have that approach. I'd be anxious. And I'd say, why am I not getting, you know, moved up the ladder? But at 45, I was just happy to be involved in it. And, and as, you know, as luck would have it, uh, 
they've got me now working postseason games and and at the varsity level, which I am just I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Imagine that as a, a CFO is the rules guy. Uh, I mean, you know, who who would have ever thought? Now, I I think that's true in all the sports. I mean, I see it in Major League Baseball with the umpires too. There's all they all know the rules. It's not that they don't know the rules, but there's one guy that knows the rule book on every crew maybe better than the rest that's known, you know, just when something goes wrong or something's a little bit questionable, you've got to have somebody that that can pay attention to detail. Clearly you can. But the other interesting side to this, and I think it all ties into the, the times we're in right now. I mean, you're, you're refereeing basketball games right now. There aren't a whole lot of people in the stands. There probably most nights isn't a band playing, which means that you hear everything from the crowd. You hear everything from every player. Uh, more than just what you do within a few feet. What has that done in terms of communication and really having that radar up and and trying to keep everybody, I don't know if comm is really the right word, but trying to keep everybody going in the right direction at a time where things could be a bit tense? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting because I think in a way it's actually made things a little bit better, and I'll tell you why. The people in the stands, when you have 500 people in the stands and they yell, you know, half the half the stands yell, all you hear is just this din of noise, you know, oh. But when you've got 25 people in the stands, they're a little less likely to, to stand up and, and scream at you uh, and be called out on that. You know, we never listen to the fans anyway. You know, it's uh, we just we do our we do our thing. But the coaches as well, it gives you a better time. And with the players, you can bond with them a little bit better because there's not a whole lot going on that's, that's, you know, keeping you from doing that. So coaches have actually been in, in my experience this year have been better because they know they can't scream across the court at you. Everybody will hear it. So we have good conversations. And so there's, there's always something positive when, when things are going bad. Right. And if it's really what your mind focuses on and you can focus on that, that guy in the stands that's, that's screaming at you and turn around and get the, administrator to remove him from the game where you can just focus on the the positivity of of working with the players and working with the coaches and um that's what i've tried to do really and so it's different it is different though I'll, i'll grant you that so you have all of these experiences and you put them in a book sportsmanship go viral with it there's a hashtag at the beginning of sportsmanship so hashtag sportsmanship uh go viral with it Tell me about this, because there have been books written about sportsmanship before, and we always need that. Anyone that has gone to any youth sporting event can argue over which sport has the most unruly parents. Uh, As a father of a hockey player, I vote hockey, but I know that basketball, baseball, whatever it is, there's always stuff going on. And, And that can be a little disconcerting at times, especially when you're talking about kids and it oftentimes being the parents but what was the the motivation and the inspiration for this book which really comes from a different perspective sure. i think it's a good question part of it is again we go back to mentorship and and, and wanting to give back and 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 help people get better right and so that that's sort of a, keep that aside a little bit but that was part of it but really where this came from is after years and years of after a basketball game, sitting around a table with your fellow officials and talking about stories and the good, the bad that they've experienced that night. And after every one of those meetings, somebody says, I'm going to write a book about this. I'm going to write a book about this. Right. So one day I said, I'm going to write a book about this. And in researching that there are, there are companies that have been around forever that are built on sportsmanship. Uh, you know, they're part of the NAIA is, you know, a sportsmanship arm. And they, so th- it's not new in that regard, but I, to my knowledge, I haven't found a book that was b- been written from an official's viewpoint on this. And that's really what, what started the whole process. And, and strangely enough, I, we came up with the title before the, the pandemic hit. And when the pandemic hit, I thought, how fortuitous is that? But it really came down to, you know, what can we what can we put in a book that will give a little bit of a different perspective um, and will will hopefully enlighten fans, parents, coaches uh, to to what's really important, you know, and and what what we should migrate away from the internal environment, 
or the external environment that we're putting our kids in. And what we can do on the car ride home to, to help that kid want to want to stay engaged. As I say in the book and everybody, you know, it's been published elsewhere is that by the time they're 13, 70 percent of kids have quit. And they haven't quit because their skill level is poor. They've quit because of us parents, adults that have have driven them away from the game that they love. And that's really the motivation for for doing that. And I wanted to do it in a fun way as well. There's a little bit of psychology in the book, but there's also 15 different stories, uh, good and bad, that have happened on the court that I, I think people can relate to. And they can they can look at, you know, they can see themselves in this book, both good and bad. I know I can. I wrote it and, and throughout that book. I'm saying, you know, if I had to do it over, you know, my car right home with my kids would be far different than what it was, right? And then, and then we talk about how you can make that change. You know, what humility being, you know, as we talked about earlier, humility being the cornerstone of that. And how do you breed that into your kids? You know, how does, how does Tim Tebow, a top athlete, be so humble uh, in, in his endeavors? And so we talk a little bit about that as well. So that's how it came to be, really, a bunch of us guys sitting around the table saying, I'm going to write a book. And I just, I did it. <laughs> Last question on that, having just written – my book a little bit after you, it's a, for me at least, it, it's a scary process, not so much the writing, not so much everything that go, all the logistics that go into it. That's nerve wracking. There's pressure involved in that, in completing a major project, but you find guidance along the way, you you seek advice, you, you make your decisions and you learn as you're going for the first time. But you don't know how it's going to be received. You're putting yourself out there. And that had to have been uh, an interesting and, and unique experience because you don't know what's going to happen. It is. And, and you're, you're quite familiar with this as well. It's, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit like um, uh, there was a, a goaltender speaking of hockey in the NHL. I said, what's it feel like when they score a goal on you? And he said, it feels like I got my pants down in front of 15,000 people, right? Well, writing this book and putting it out there, uh, I, you know, I, I went through some of my friends first and said, give me the honest opinion. Is this, is this going to be odd or, or what? But, you know, quoting Babe Ruth, he said, never let the fear of striking out get in your way. Right. So that's really, you, you know, as you know, Joel, you just have to run through the fire and, and if it's a passion uh, that you have and, and uh, your heart's in the right place. You, that's just what you do. And so, but you're right. It, it is a bit nerve wracking and, and, um, you know, so far, the reception has been positive. So it's all good. If people want to learn more about the book, they can go to jeckertbooks.com, jeckert, E-C-K-E-R-T, books.com. Let's now shift gears just a, a little bit and go to the baseball-themed questions brought to you by Kissick Construction, trusted team, reliable partner. Check them out at kissickco.com. Professionally speaking, we've covered a lot of ground here. What's the biggest home run that you've hit in your career, Jeff? Well, you know, first of all, you know, the, the guests that you have on your show are captains of industry, captains of sports. Uh, they are impressive, impressive individuals. And and I'm humbled that even that I'm even here. But I would say mine is, is really a collective home run. Uh, you know, I never I never started out uh, to be you know, uh, someone like uh, Branson or Elon Musk or anybody like that, where they, they risk it all, they, they mortgage to the hilt, they, they move on and, uh, and, and do it again. Mine, mine has been more of, you know, when I started my own business and, and ran that for 10 years, helping over 100 companies start up, you know, in, in, especially in the medical field, start up or become stable so they could see patients and do things. I, I look at the, the ripple effect of that and think, you know, there's somebody out there that, that benefited from that, that's healthier today than they were back then. Um, but really the, the other part of that home run, it's not one single thing. Uh, I didn't start Tesla, right? And I can say that's my home run. It's been more about a legacy. It's been more about a mentoring students, you know, at the college level and seeing those 18, 19, 20 year olds back then and I turn on CNN or Fox News or whatever, and I see them on the news. And um, there's one in particular in St. Louis that that has been in the oil and gas industry, and he's he's a 
analyst for them. And, you know, I, I, that and I say, I, you know, there's something that I had a small part in and whether it's mentoring young officials or, or uh, coaching uh, the kids that I coached, I think collectively that's the home run. You know, that's something that uh, you've, you've left a piece uh, out there where, where somebody else has gone on to, to greatness. And that's what I hope. It's fantastic because it's not a moment. It's it's a long term thing, and as you mentioned, a legacy. Okay, that miss when you swing like Babe Ruth. You just mentioned you're going to miss a lot of times. It's okay, especially as I always say, if you learn from it. What's a big swing and miss you've taken, and what did you learn from it? Sure, great question. And you know what's funny is I I pondered that since I knew the question was going to come up at some point. I have racked my brain how to, how to answer that and. Really, the, the best way is, and I think it's going to lead into some other questions regarding small ball and whatnot, but, you know, we all have failures, whether it's failures at work and jobs or, and we move on and we learn from those. My goal was to keep those from being catastrophic. It's just a philosophy in life, right? It's, it's um, you know, somebody asked Pete Rose, you know, when he was playing, you know, why do you just hit single? He said, because that's that's what I do. It's, it, it gets our, our team from first base to second base. He said, I could hit 30 home runs in a year if the coach wanted me to, but that's not what's best for for the team. For me, my my swings and misses have been have been relatively small, uh, you know, because of that philosophy. It's it's when something doesn't work out, you learn from it. You 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 know reflect, self reflect, grow a little bit and then move on to the next thing. So I've been, my philosophy has been to try to avoid that. I haven't, I haven't gone out and, and grabbed a, a $10 million, you know, bond and, and tried to do something, you know, like the, the fellows that I mentioned before. Um, so it's been, you know, it's the swings and misses have been, um, have been rather small and I've been, I've been blessed for that. Um, so not, not, not a huge one. I'm, I'm glad to say I, I still have my house. So <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Just a, a swing here and a miss, a swing and a miss there. Yeah. And then you make contact and, and you keep on rolling. Last baseball theme question, small ball. The book is small ball, big results. And certainly everybody can find that on Amazon, made in KC, bliss books and wine, or you can reach out to me, Joel Goldberg media.com. That's the little promo. How about for you? What are the little things that add up to the big things? Right. And that's the flip side of the swing and miss, you know, not having a, you know, too many strikeouts, right? Uh, it, my favorite quote of, of, of all time is from Vince Lombardi, where he says, you know, perfection is not attainable, but if we chase perfection, we can catch excellence. You do that in an incremental way. And so the small ball is, is every day uh, trying to improve or take the right path. We're, we're either on an upward slope or a downward slope, and it's very incremental. You don't notice it. And that if you read the book, The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson, he talks about that. You know, if you eat a hamburger today, you're not going to notice it. But if you do it for 20 years, you will, right? If you climb the stairs today, you won't notice it. But if you do it for 30 years, rather than take the elevator, you'll know it. So it's those incremental incremental improvement um, steps that we all take that I think uh, helps us get to excellence. Uh, you know, we, we talked about Fortune 500, and I worked for Emerson Electric way back in the day. And they were just laser focused on increasing their earnings per share every quarter from the previous year. They wanted to have record earnings per share every single quarter. And they got vilified for such a short term myopic, you know, uh, you know, goal. Well, they did it for 240 some odd quarters in a row, which is about 30 years. So the small ball aspect of that is we're taking care of what we need to take care of today, and it's leading to a great future, big results down the road, 30 years of record earnings per share. So that that has been sort of uh, my mentality as well, is just, you know, just try to go from, from, you know, below average to average to above average to excellent to elite. And you do that in steps, and that's where small ball comes into play. Uh, you don't you don't eat the elephant in one bite, right? 
Absolutely. Okay, four final questions as we round the bases. First one, what are some of the most misunderstood rules in different sports? <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, well, probably in basketball, the most misunderstood rule is the block charge, right? Mm -hmm. So it all depends on whether the defender has legal guarding position, and there's a there's a definition for that. And, and a lot of coaches, a lot of players, a lot of fans think that that player can't be, that defender can't be moving, and he can. He can be moving, and so, uh, so that's a that's a big one in basketball, and that's I, I coach, you know, or I officiate uh, basketball primarily. I do volleyball as well, but um, but that's that's one of the biggest ones. And you know, if you if you go into different sports in baseball, um, you know, the strike zone is a big um, misunderstood. You know, it's not a rule, but what, what is a strike zone? And it's different for a fourth grader than it is for a, a pro ball player. If you're talking about soccer, they talk about offsides. Uh, that's a misunderstood rule of what constitutes offsides in soccer. Uh, and I had to, in writing this book, I had wonderful fellow officials give me advice on all of these. And, and they're part of the appendix of this book. Um, but uh, so those are three right off the bat that come to mind that, that are completely misunderstood. And hopefully if somebody buys the book, they'll learn them. Second question, a little bit along the same lines. What does it take to get a technical foul from Jeff Eckert? Yeah. Well, you know, and that's funny because every official has got a different threshold, right? Yeah. For me, it what it comes down to is if you question, if you question competency or ethics, really, uh, you know, you're a homer type of thing, right? Uh, that's that's going to be a quick one. We were blessed because we a couple of years ago we got a new mechanic, which was a a warning, a, a bench warning. Uh, so we can, if a coach is getting close to that uh, level, uh, we can we can buffer that and, and issue a bench warning instead of a technical. Uh, and so that for me, uh, I, I try not to have rabbit ears. You know, I try to go up and down and do my and do my thing. You know, if we have a if we have a sporting technical where somebody you know punches somebody or or a player drops the f-bomb or something like that those are no-brainers and you just go those right off the bat you know coach throws his clipboard across the you know they, those are no-brainers but when the coaches are are talking to you respectfully and 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 they've got questions uh we answer those questions and so it's i, I guess i'm what i'm saying is i'm you have to go pretty far for me to give you a technical I know the hockey world so well, and I sit down there and work the scoreboard, and there, there's no shortage of stuff going on out there. I will put it to you that way in a very high-charged sport in, indeed. So it's not an easy job. I know that. Third question as we continue to round the bases, let's talk about that book that you wrote. What to you, as the author, or even what you've heard from – readers, friends, family, whoever, what's been the biggest takeaway? Gosh, good, good question. Uh, writing the book, um, you really get a sense of how little it takes to change culture. Hmm. It It is, um, you know, modeling, as the book says, modeling great behavior and, and then that begets positive change, which begets culture. But you can do that as an individual. It doesn't take a movement. It doesn't take uh, you know, a lot of um, you know a lot of effort. It's it's simple things. And what this book boils down to is how that at the end of the book I talk about nine things you can do to change culture. And each one of them, when you look at those, are very simplistic. And it's an aha moment that. You know, I really didn't think of it in that in that format. But, you know, nobody goes to a, a sporting event saying, I'm just going to go there and I'm just going to scream at the officials all day long. That's nobody does that. Right. Nobody says I'm going to make my kid feel bad. Uh, but somehow we don't understand the messages that we're sending. And every message that you send is received, uh, you know, by by the officials or by your kid or, or whatever, uh, whoever's the recipient of that. That's what the takeaway of this book is, is you can change this. You, and, and hopefully when they read it, they'll get a bit of humor out of it. Uh, they'll, they'll be aghast in some, in some situations, but it's, 
it's really how simple it is to change culture and that's what they understand important lesson in any walk of life pretty much every day as far as i'm concerned because culture should never take a day off or any time off final question the walk off i know the deal once you write one you sit there and say oh man i don't know if i can go through this again and then suddenly say but i got more to talk about or i got more to write at least that's the way i'm feeling i want to take a little bit of time but i know that there's another one in the works and it'll be a little bit different for you without giving away whatever you can't give away give us whatever you can give away what are you what are you thinking about yeah yeah there's this is written for adults this book you know sportsmanship go viral with it is uh is written for adults and the next one is going to be written for children it's going to be um about uh two two young athletes uh one exhibits good sportsmanship and one doesn't and, and they're connected and how they how they can uh both change so Again, it's ruminating around in the brain right now, and I've, I've got uh, some thoughts on that. Um, the other, the other book. There's actually another one. The, the feedback you mentioned earlier. What kind of feedback? You know, you put yourself out there, and you, you don't know what what you're going to get. The feedback I got from this book is, I need a book of nothing but stories, stories from the arena, and and, and put that out. And they said, well, you know, we can supply you with 200 of them, and they thought that that would be a uh, you know, a good follow-up as well. So there's probably a couple of them in the works there, but the next one is, is going to be geared toward the, the young athlete, you know, eight years old, nine years old, that type of thing. And, and how they can, uh, how they can grow to, to be a good athlete. Well, if people want to find out more and get those updates, certainly on the current book and the next one, when that comes into action, you can go to J We've also talked quite a bit about Catholic charities of Kansas city and St. Joseph to find out more about them. I know that you mentioned a, a big gala coming up, catholiccharities-kcsj.org. Jeff, congratulations on the book, on, on really a truly unique, interesting, and successful career path, and good luck with all the calls coming up because they always, uh, you know, no pressure at all. But they always matter. Everyone's always looking. And those games can't happen without the work that you guys do on the court. So I don't know that you hear it a whole lot, but thanks for what you do out there. Maybe every now and then you'll get a thanks. Probably not as as often as maybe it's deserved. Right. It, it's getting better. It's getting better. So I appreciate that, Joel. I appreciate your time so much. Uh, and congratulations to you on your book. And I uh, can't wait to get a signed copy of that as well. It's in the mail, actually, as, as we speak, believe it or not. I'm just making, I'm not making that up. You know that that is the case. So your book is on the way. I've got yours. Thanks for being a fantastic guest and keep it going. Thanks, Jeff. You bet. Take care, Joel. Talk to you soon. All right. Good to be able to visit with Jeff Eckert. That's going to do it for another edition of Rounding the Bases. Shout out to my sponsors, Kansas City Audiovisual. Kiss of Construction and Enterprise Bank and Trust businesses often come to Enterprise Bank because they demand and frankly are worthy of more than the status quo and need a local partner who understands their business. I'm Joel Goldberg. You can get my book at joelgoldbergmedia.com or all the other outlets. And that's going to do it for another episode of Rounding the Bases presented by Enterprise Bank and Trust. Hope to catch you next time.